I think maybe a little more of a walk through um, a journal article. And I thought instead I'd kind of talk through a little bit of the work I've been doing and pull from a couple articles and, you know, in a sort of informal setting, I'm happy to like stop and chat and um, don't know about like kind of questions, but I think um, I talk a little bit about kind of the goal for today. And I started um, some of this work back in my PhD, like some of the stuff I was doing before that Daniel mentioned. And um, I thought I would chat kind of about the next directions that we took and, and kind of what I'm working on now, because I think they're related and um, potentially sort of some newer areas that other people who are working in metabolomics, you know, might be um, of interest in maybe in future for you. So. Um, yeah, so let's let's get started. Let me um, start. So just I, I don't know everyone's background, so I thought I'd start with just metabolomics generally. Um, so, you know, in and in, as with other omics, metabolomics um, is kind of the body wide scan or tissue wide scan of wherever you've measured them of small molecules that can be um, picked up. In, and, and you can pick them up in, in many biological tissues. Um, and so in, I guess the formal definition would include a um, consideration of the molecular weight. And so, you know, the formal is between 50 to 1500 Daltons. Um, most of the, like in general, we, we are talking about organic compounds, so carbon containing compounds, although we also pick up um, exogenous compounds when we, uh, for example, measure metabolomics in the blood or serum. Um, so things that come from uh, outside the body sources like drug metabolites or uh, microbiome or something like that. Um, so we, we know that there's more than 3,000 endogenous and pretty common metabolites in humans, but we also know there's uh, a lot in global metabolomics that you may pick up that we don't know what it is or sort of the, the underlying body of how many metabolites are there, are there expected to be, um, is, is made perhaps not, not known yet um, that we have measured a lot of them. Um, and so a lot of when, when we talk about metabolomics, a lot of what we're, we're talking about is the, um, the assessment of really all the biological compounds um, that are participating or a result of um, homeostasis, chemical reactions that are happening in the body. And so I pulled this example from online and I think there's, there's a great, you know, sort of, uh, examples of different sorts of chemical reactions. And so, you know, when molecules bind together to form a larger molecule, or you could capture the two molecules when they're not in a bound state, um, when something is being degraded, you know, and so it's losing this bond right here, which is really a different, the identity of the degraded molecule is something different than uh, the original. And so there's a lot of examples here. Um, and I, I, I included this because we'll talk about this perhaps a little bit later about some of the future work that I'm working on now, um, that uh, can we pick up sort of these um, reaction or the reaction rate and, and how do we identify sort of um, what stage of this are we on, the before or the after, or perhaps not even that, but sort of um, how do we measure the, the process of what is happening perhaps a little better than either this precursor molecule or the end state molecule. Because we know that at the same time that that reaction might be happening in order to maintain homeostasis, some other reaction is happening at the same time. Um, and so this might be um, used for the next reaction um, in the body. So anyways, just a lot of um, examples. I think for the purposes of my talk, I'm gonna um, consider when I say metabolomics, I mean lipidomics and metabolomics. Um, so both polar and uncharged molecules, um, which some people like to differentiate, but I'm gonna talk about them together. Um, so, you know, I landed in this world on accident um, and have since thought a lot about um, you know, what is the value of metabolomics and um, where should we be using it? Um, and, and what, how can it help us? Um, and then what kinds of questions can it really help us answer? And so part of the context I think is to understand that 
you know, I think of metabolomics as sort of the phenotypic omics because it's pretty downstream of everything else. Um, and so in terms of the sort of biological, the central dogma where you've got genes that become, that are transcribed into RNA that are then, uh, that are then translated into proteins. And then those proteins, some, you know, for example, enzymes may control some of these chemical reactions. And so um, metabolite, metabolomics is downstream of a lot of the other omics that we use to kind of understand and gain biological insight. Um, but we also pick up in the metabolome, the exposome. And so the things that you eat, the quality of the air that you live in, um, the Chem, the toxins that we may accidentally um, ingest or inhale or the things we intentionally put in to our bodies smoking. Um, so a lot of this, you can pick up metabolites um, in different tissues in the body. Um, and then of course it also the microbiome. So our own gut microbiome, there are metabolites from the microbiome that are picked up in the metabolome. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of inputs um, of other processes in the body that are influencing what, what we can see. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've drawn one directional arrows, but we know probably some of these are bi-directional um, because the, you know, if, if a certain, let's say compound shows up more often in the microbiome, it, or in the in the metabolome that may trigger oh some other reaction to like you know in terms of homeostasis that there's this equilibrium trying to be maintained and so um, I think that uh, this may be somewhat bidirectional some of these relationships um, so I think you know if there's a broad class of sort of ways or areas that metabolomics is often used I've I've listed several of them here and this came from a review. Um, from, so I'm, I'm working now in precision personalized medicine. Um, and so there was a great review from some people in the Metabolomics Society um, here a couple of years ago, and they outlined some work in, in these different areas. And I think, uh, so can we use that sort of phenotypic omics to, to classify people by disease state or to understand what's happening behind the scenes um, or sort of on the way to disease if you have prospective data? Um, can we use it for screening or for understanding of baseline disease risk? And so this is an idea, I'm going to introduce this word metabotype because it's going to come up um, later also, but this is the idea that there is um, some sort of genetic influence on uh, the continuous or quantitative trait that, that is showing up that you're capturing in the metabolome, um, and, and it has a genetic component. And you know, using the genetics, you could understand the baseline risk uh, that someone has. And so, you know, I think many people are familiar. If you have a child, you're familiar that they get a newborn screen very early, like at birth, um, where uh, they do a, a panel of screening for certain enzymatically sort of genetically determined um, markers of inborn errors of metabolism. And these are um, determined by your genetics and uh, some of them are life-threatening, but they're, if we know what enzyme, for example, or what protein you can't make, there's a, uh, a known treatment intervention that then can save your life. And so um, there's this idea in metabolomics that um, perhaps, you know, we know of very severe cases of genes that determine these like molecular phenotypes or that determine what molecules are, are not there that are essential for certain functions. Um, and that there are likely a large spectrum of other metabotypes or sort of these inborn errors that influence um, what shows up in the metabolome. And if we could identify those, we maybe could identify other risk um, sort of baseline risk disorders that might have treatable um, treatments, readily available treatments. Um, so that kind of ta taps into, I think, the genetically influenced metabotype and the risk prediction. Um, intervention targets and kind of response to treatment. So I think in this group, diabetes, like A1C is a great example of how we look at like, you know, sort of these dynamic state compounds and how they might be reflecting how well someone is adhering to treatment or how well the treatment is working for them um, and sort of our uh, um, 
a continuous marker that we can look at for um, the molecular response or sort of the biological response. So most of the stuff that I have been working on has kind of landed in the top two categories here. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd talk through some of this. So this was an, this is kind of a broad overview of uh, some of my dissertation work. And as Daniel mentioned, I, or we were just chatting. I have um, been very fortunate and moved pretty quickly into a faculty position after a postdoc. Um, and I met this group at the end of my PhD uh, in Cambridge. So, or not everyone, Daniel and I met before, but um, I, I did work with um, dietary patterns and um, metabolomic, untargeted metabolomics in two prospective cohorts um, as part of my dissertation. And um, I'll talk through some of the implications of this, but just to give shout outs at the beginning to, um, I was very fortunate to have support from the Teddy study. And of course they're um, a large prospective study. I'll talk more about the study design in just a second. Um, but people were very kind to help me um, work access and work with the metabolomics data in Teddy. And then also in the DAISY study, which is a similar, DAISY and Teddy share a lot of investigators. They share similar scientific goals. Um, and the difference being that they're, they were uh, about 10 years apart um, being established. And so the DAISY study on average, um, children participating in the DAISY study are about 10 years older than those in the Teddy study. Um, and DAISY is specific to Colorado. And so um, this was kind of my home group of investigators and um, both, both studies used uh, metabolomics data from the UC Davis West Coast Metabolomics Center and Oliver Fien is the head of that group. Um, and so all of the underlined individuals were uh, members of my dissertation committee who um, were incredibly valuable in guiding me along the way. So, um, I'll talk a little, I'm, I know there's a, a heavy type two influence here. So I'll talk a little about how we study type one um, and, and what makes it, I don't know exactly what makes it different if that's the best way to say this, but um, highlight some key components of the disease process that are important in the prospective studies that we commonly look at. So um, type one diabetes is autoimmune, meaning that your own body will attack yourself. Um, and destroys the insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas. Um, and as we, this, for the most part, that process is asymptomatic. So the only indication you would have, unless you were looking for it, but the only indication you would have that, that process has occurred is um, when you get diagnosed. And so when you're no longer uh, able to produce insulin and you have um, high blood sugar and end up in the hospital perhaps. So the average age of diagnosis is in childhood um, around 10 years. Um, and although it, it can happen much earlier in life. So, you know, you can imagine a four-year-old uh, who then for the rest of their life has to be, have exogenous insulin um, on insulin treatment. Um, so if we go looking for um, sort of the disease process, we can find early markers um, that we use to study the disease. And um, you can, there, there are four in particular antigens that we, autoantigens that we look for in, in studying type one diabetes and they're listed here. Um, and so we kind of call over the years, over many decades, it's been known that, um, if you have kind of persistent positivity to one or more of these autoantigens or antibody, if you have these antibodies, um, that your risk for developing type one diabetes is significantly increased. And so we use islet autoimmunity or this preclinical um, detection of these persistent uh, autoantibodies as a preclinical marker of, of disease progression in these in prospective studies of type one diabetes. Um, so if you have a single antibody that we can consistently detect, we call that islet autoimmunity. If you have more than one, we also call it auto islet autoimmunity. But um, if you're multiple autoantibody positive, your risk for developing type 1 diabetes um, approaches 100%. So it's um, assumed like you will, you will get, you will become diabetic um, at some point in your life. Um, and so one of the cool things in, in our world, um, when from, I think, when I started my PhD, sometime during my PhD, so in the last five years, um, 
they, uh, the American Diabetes Association has reclassified um, type one diabetes. So there are now stages that encapsulate and reflect this risk for people that have multiple autoantibodies. Um, and so that's now called stage one type one diabetes, where if you were to go and um, measure antibody, these antibodies in, in a child or, or an adult, um, and you could consistently see at least two of them, they would be considered a stage one type one diabetic. Um, and again, that's a, it's, it's asymptomatic. They have no glycemic indication. They have no symptoms, um, but their lifetime risk for diabetes is, is near 100%. Um, so that was kind of a cool thing that's like happened over the course of my short time <laughs> academic life. Um, and uh, so in terms of risk factors for type one diabetes, um, we know the genetics is pretty well described. Um, there are large type one diabetes consortia. There's recently a new paper by Steve Rich's group that has done um, expanded our uh, discovery of genetics of type one diabetes in a multi-ethnic adult population. Uh, so a lot of the research has been done in Europeans, through people of European ancestry. Uh, but we also know there's environmental factors. And so um, one of some of the evidence behind that um, this is a review paper we wrote a couple of years ago where we pulled together all the prospective data on um, incidents of type 1 diabetes over the years. And, you know, people often will uh, make this claim in, um, in, in, you know, kind of your grants and your papers that the incidence is, is probably doubling every um, couple decades. Um, over time. And so this data goes back to the 1960s, where you can see that incidence is rising in most parts of the world. Um, and there's heavy representation here of uh, Scandinavia, because uh, you guys have the best <laughs> uh, data <laughs> to look at this. Um, but there's some, some studies from the US who um, have contributed to um, so incidence is increasing and it's expected, it's, in, it's estimated it's increasing faster than the, gen, the known genetic risk can account for. Um, and so this, that's an indication, one indication that environmental factors are important. The second indication is that um, from some of the prospective studies, so baby diab is a prospective study of type one diabetes where they follow kids at risk who did not yet have disease. Hedy is also um, a prospective cohort following kids at risk for type one diabetes. And when they looked at data for the incidence of IA, so just preclinical endpoint um, over time and whether or not people progress from IA to clinical diabetes, um, what they found is that over time, the incidence of IA over kind of secular time over the years has not changed, but the rate of progression to type one diabetes is likely what's responsible for the increase in incidence overall. So the same number of people are probably getting IA now as had IA before, but something is triggering them, more people now to go on to diabetes. And so what are those environmental factors um, that are responsible for the increased rate of progression from IA to type one diabetes is a question, scientific question of interest, because that would be really great time to perhaps find an intervention, right? So what is, whatever the environmental factor is that's making more people develop symptomatic diabetes, it'd be great to find it and uh, change it, right? Um, so the likely explanation is, is kind of changing environmental factors. So some protective factor maybe decreased, um, is decreasing in prevalence over time or uh, exposure to some factor that increases risk may be increasing prevalence over time. Um, so in my dissertation, you know, I was primarily interested in the diet um, and, and interested in uh, expanding some of the research in type 1 diabetes that have been focused primarily on individual um, food groups and nutrients. And, and that was the bulk of our um, scientific you know, sort of the state of our nutritional epidemiology in, in the type one diabetes world. And so I was trying to get to um, dietary patterns and what is the best way to kind of capture um, or reduce that data to sort of meaningful, smaller number of variables that we could test. Um, 
And so, you know, there's a lot of issues, I guess, or there's a lot of considerations, which I know Daniel's aware of, and it's sort of how do you make a pattern that's meaningful? And are you trying to capture, um, you know, in, in our case, we're trying to capture disease related variation, um, which may be different than the main, main sort of variation, like people on healthy diets versus non healthy diets. Um, that's not related to development of type one diabetes, but there could be some combination of other factors that are related to development of type one diabetes. So the meaningful variation for this endpoint um, was really kind of a question we thought about quite a bit. And in the end, um, I ended up working with metabolomics because um, that was our solution. Well, maybe we could use metabolites um, to capture meaningful variation in the diet. Um, in, in sort of patterns in the diet. So we use them together um, in both the Teddy and the DAISY studies. And so just a little bit about the study design and how data were collected in these two cohorts. Um, so Teddy uh, and DAISY both recruit children at birth and follow them prospectively. Um, children come in at regular intervals. So in DAISY, they come in every six to 12 months. Um, and in Teddy, they come in every three to six months. Um, Teddy is, is just starting to disenroll. Um, so they're only following children until age 15 and some of their oldest kids are now 15 years old. And so, um, you know, some people, some children who are um, aging out of Teddy have never developed any signs of autoimmunity or diabetes. Some, um, and these are the ones we call IA cases, have uh, in those clinical visits, we've detected um, persistent autoantibodies to insulin, GAD, zinc, uh, ZNT8, or um, IA insulinoma antigens. And some of them um, have also then progressed to type 1 diabetes. And so um, some children will progress fast enough through that autoimmune phase that we never pick it up with our frequency of visits. Um, the three to six months is not, you know, they progress in one month, they're autoantibody free, the next month they have diabetes, or the next visit they have diabetes. Um, but for the most part, we, we assume everyone goes through an autoimmune phase. Um, so in Teddy, these are a few differences between them. There are 9,000 or 8,500 children that were recruited and they represent four countries. So this is the largest prospective uh, birth cohort of type 1 diabetes and anyone who wants to you know study anything in this area I, I think this is the kind of premier cohort to work in um, they collected in terms you know the relevant measures for my dissertation were how we collected dietary intake and metabolomics and so dietary intake was collected by three-day food record um, in order to get uh, omics markers generally. So they have a lot in Teddy, they have whole genome sequencing and genotyping arrays and gene expression, proteomics, maybe not proteomics yet, metabolomics, lipidomics. Um, they, they conducted a nested case control study. So as of 200, as of 2012, 418 IA cases had developed and um, they selected disease-free subjects who were the same age and they matched on a couple of um, clinical center, age, sex, and family history of T1D and selected three controls for every case that were, um, the controls were disease-free and matched on these subjects at the time, uh, the age that the IA case became a case. Um, and, and then metabolomics was generated on that 418 plus all their controls. From citrate plasma, um, and the citrated part is not as highly not recommended for metabolomic studies. <laughs> and now Teddy knows that. Um, in DAISY, we had similar study design um, where there were, so we study uh, roughly 2,500 children who were recruited at birth and followed prospectively in the same way. Um, clinic visits are every six to 12 months. And we also conducted a nested case control study um, by selecting I 132 IA cases that were available in 2015, and we matched controls to those cases. Um, we collect, instead of um, dietary intake by food records, uh, we collect by FFQ in DAISY, so um, it's slightly different. They have different implications for what pieces of the diet you, you think you have captured well but for FFQ versus dietary record a food record. Um, and we also did metabolomics and this was um, from non-fasting serum. 
Uh, so I thought I would just kind of jump straight to results. So in my dissertation, the, the important part was we were trying to under to first study the metabolome and understand what are the metabolome, metabolome wide signals um, that are associated with our disease endpoints. And then we use those to develop dietary patterns to, to help focus which part of the diet might matter for type one diabetes. Um, so in the Teddy study, um, we looked at all, so this is showing the results of um, 853 compounds that were measured at nine months of age, which is prior to developing all, all of the cases and controls were disease-free at that time. Um, and we looked at the risk of multiple autoantibody positivity, which is that stage one uh, asymptomatic, but now called stage one type one diabetes. Um, so they're showing multiple markers and those are, it's almost a surrogate for a type one diabetes case definition, because uh, these people will all go on to diabetes. Um, you can see, you know, if you look at, um, we have odds ratios along the bottom. This is a conditional logistic regression because we're in a match study design. Um, and we have the minus log 10 p-value on the top. So if you look at, I now work a lot in other omics data sets. And um, one of the, I didn't understand at the time, uh, people are used to seeing minus log 10 p-values like to the 10, to the 12, to the 15. And so, um, metabolomics, these are pretty nominal. So we've put a line at the nominal 0.05 just for a sense of, you get a sense of how strong these signals are, um, which is not very strong, um, <laughs> I think, um, but pretty typical for what I've seen in um, other kind of similarly sized studies that I've worked with since then. And so, um, yeah, we have some maybe perhaps interesting patterns. I know this pattern we diagnosed later on as metabolites that we should have excluded during the filtering step because they were not variable. Um, and so, you know, this is, uh, there was a lot of learning in my PhD, but this is something that we kind of evaluated and, and understood why these are all seem like, wow, we found them. These are them. <laughs> why aren't they significant? They have really large effect sizes. But, um, so essentially what we, what we found was that um, choline containing compounds, there's certain classes of molecules, um, phosphatidylcholine, sphingomyelins, um, ether, phospholipids, um, several of these, these classes of molecules and um, some ser ceramide classes of molecules were protect at, at nine months were protective for the development of multiple antibody positivity. So higher levels, uh, controls had higher levels of all these compounds. Um, and there was a, a, a sixth class of compound that was associated with increased risk of diabetes later. Um, and so we, we kind of took that, I'm gonna speed through this so that we can, and not focus much on the diet, although we could always um, come back around to that. So we took the, um, these compounds that were driving this, association in each of these classes and use them to create dietary patterns and then tested the dietary pattern. And what we found is that dicarboxylic acid compounds were not um, really that related to the diet, um, but all of these lipids seem to be in a dietary pattern that um, kind of summarized or related, kind of summarized the variability in these lipids um, was associated with protection from multiple autoantibody positivity in the nested case control study, but we couldn't replicate that finding in the full cohort. Um, and so, uh, so I'm, you know, it could just be a by chance. It could be, you know, you need larger sample size to find the same association when you're sort of uh, imputing into an external cohort. I'm not sure exactly why we couldn't replicate it, but there's a lot of speculations we could give. Um, so we also did, um, and naively, perhaps, uh, if you work with, I don't know, does anyone work with metabolomics data? I'm just curious, on the call, no? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, naively, I had thought, oh, these studies are very similar in how they follow kids. They have very similar inclusion, exclusion criteria. We have generated untargeted metabolomics from the same labs, from the same lab. 
using the same technology, um, I thought we have a really high chance of finding the same signals. Um, and I, I think that was pretty naive because um, there are, were also differences in um, the tissue that we were studying in the two studies and also in the sort of treatment of the specimen before going to like citrate plasma is very different than uh, like typically stored plasma. Um, so we, we ended up kind of pivoting because we weren't finding the same signals in the same endpoints. So I did a kind of new discovery in DAISY at a different endpoint. So um, in this study, we took all the kids with IA, there were 132, and did a Cox regression um, to identify compounds that were associated with the progression from IA to diabetes. Because um, some of those IA cases developed diabetes over time, some of them didn't. We had the time to event for each. Um, so we tested many more compounds in DAISY. We had an extra uh, sort of platform worth of um, probably an extra 1500 metabolites that we measured. Um, and the quality of the other two platforms that, that Teddy also had uh, generated metabolomic data from uh, was a little better because we didn't have the citrated plasma. Um, so we tested a, a roughly 2,500 compounds um, in Cox regression models. And um, you'll see, you maybe only recognize one, two, three names that we've labeled on this volcano plot. So again, you know, this is our hazard ratio. So all of these compounds over here were associated with increased risk of progression from IA to type one diabetes. And if you look on the y-axis, we see that um, again, the signals are not really strong. So our p-values are, um, this is again, a nominal p-value like uh, marker. So you can see kind of where things are falling out. Um, and the majority of these um, compounds that we found are unannotated compounds. So we're not really sure uh, what they are. Um, they don't have names. Um, and we tested them because we thought just because we don't know what it is doesn't mean that it doesn't have valuable information for our purpose, which was which metabolites are going to help us get to meaningful dietary pattern information. Um, so we, we took... Um, these top metabolites and created dietary patterns. This time we were using nutrient intake instead of food group intake. Um, and what we found is that children who at the time of IA were eating higher intake of total sugars and vitamin C, which if you see that you think, oh, maybe they're like drinking a lot of in the US like fruit juice or things, right? Like those, those two nutrients may go together in certain forms of food. Um, but children who were kind of, their diet kind of had this whole composition. So higher total sugars, higher vitamin C and lower intake of linoleic acid, niacin, riboflavin, vitamin K had an, an increased risk of progression to type one diabetes. Um, and it was pretty significant um, and a, a much stronger signal than any of these individual nutrients had when we tested them together. Um, and so we're capturing something about the combination of the diet um, is, is reflecting a stronger association with diabetes than uh, if we had looked at these things individually. Um, and even using unknown metabolomics had helped us to do that. We're not sure what great information was contained in there, right? But um, something was. So, you know, in the context of um, what we had found before each of, so these are each of the components of the dietary pattern that was um, kind of important. And this is the prior literature. So, or this is the direction on the dietary pattern. So um, higher total sugars, the way to read this figure, I guess, is our table is higher total sugars in our dietary pattern increase the risk um, of, of progression. Linoleic acid was in the opposite direction. So it, it was a negative inverse association, lower linoleic acid was associated with that increased risk of diabetes progression. So each of these had been found individually before. Um, the total sugars um, had been found individually. Linoleic acid had been found inconsistently across studies. And so now we think, well, maybe that's because we weren't accounting for um, it in combination with everything else. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip, skip through some of that. So, you know, at the end of my dissertation, I, um, the goal was, am I supposed to stop pretty soon? I am, yeah, sorry. I just looked at the time. Um, it's free form. So take okay. the, time, <laughs> yeah. use the rest for questions. No okay, cool. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I kind of want to move into like, kind of how did we use this? So um, at the end of our, of my dissertation, we had kind of, you know, maybe made some contributions, but they didn't feel that impactful in terms of our metabolome wide associations were not that strong. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of reasons that that could be, but we do suspect because we find nominal signals in almost all type one diabetes studies for the metabolome. Um, so we started asking ourselves kind of some questions around well, why, why is the signal so weak and why isn't it the same as, you know, some other, other places or kind of other omics. And um, so one thing we know is that metabolomics is really highly variable and it's variable by specimen, by tissue, by lab that you use, by how you treat. I mean, even by the day that you measure uh, the, the, that sample is injected through the mass spec machine, like you have incredible amounts of variability. Um, and some of it we assume and what we're interested in is biological, um, but, but the, the problem is how do we isolate the biological? Um, so, you know, I think because of a lot of this variability, what, what ends up in metabol happening in metabolome wide association studies, we have inconsistent associations across studies that are trying to, that are very similar, like Daisy and Teddy that have done, I mean, are probably as consistent as studies could be in studying the same endpoint um, from different groups of people. Nominal p-values, weak associations, and really I think the statistical methods in that area, is, it's sort of one of the newer metabol or ohms, the, the statistical methods that account for the unique challenges in metabolomics data are, are kind of underdeveloped or in development as we speak. So, you know, in my study, we wanted to see dietary intake um, and perhaps, you know, metabolomics, um, maybe dietary intake is a confounding factor of our metabolomic. And so maybe we're missing a really important confounder when we're doing metabolome wide association studies. But if your interest is in metabolomics and IA and T1D, we also know there's a lot of influences on the metabolome that we talked about earlier that are upstream of the metabolome and genetics, transcription, protein, all those things we talked about before that, that uh, influence variability in the metabolome. Um, and so in, in sort of my next step was, you know, how do we better isolate the signal and how can we take care of some of these potentially confounding factors in a better way so that we get to a better signal in the metabolome um, and we really can understand like the true biological signals of interest. And so uh, for me, I, I was um, interested in kind of moving into the genetic space. And so um, when we think through genetics, um, genetics don't really have a one-to-one -one connection from a gene. So if we think about, you know, from a gene comes a transcript that you can map back to that place on the genome. From the transcript comes a protein that has a code that maps back to some code on the genome. Um, the metabolites uh, are not encoded like exactly as they are um, by the genome. And so how would we capture um, what area of the genome is important for a level of a metabolite that we can study in, in a sample in our blood? Um, and so one of the ideas out there, and I would never claim this as my own, I read some literature and thought, oh, these people are really smart. Um, let's see if we can take some of this idea and apply it to type one diabetes. Um, and so this, I think Karsten's, I can't say his last name, Sur is, or I don't know how to say it, is sort of leading some, uh, leading this space, I think, looking for genetically influenced metabotypes that kind of fall along that spectrum of genes that influence not just the single compound, but um, a ratio between compounds that might reflect the reaction that's actually give, of interest in giving us information. So an example of this here, um, you have a compound, uh, a fatty acid, um, that the FADS1 gene changes into, um, it, it removes or adds a double bond, right? So it, um, it shortens this chain by like adding a double bond here. Um, and so the rate of change from this molecule to this molecule is determined. And in metabolomics, we would pick these up as two different things in our data set. So we, we would have quantitative measures of 
um, each of these fatty acids. And um, the rate of change of this to this and how efficient that reaction is, is determined by your genetics. Um, and so in particular, um, at this SNP in the FADS gene, if you are homozygote, so you have the same copy, um, you do that a lot faster. So you have a lot higher um, ratio of this to this compound. Um, and so by establishing ratios of metabolites, we perhaps can like connect the metabolome to the genome a little better and maybe isolate some of the, some of the signal, right? Rather than noise. Um, so how do we, you know, I think benefits of looking at ratios are, um, we, we don't exactly know what kind of relationship those compounds have with each other. It could be like this, where one is the substrate that goes into the reaction and one is the product that comes out. Um, it could be that two compounds compete for the same enzyme uh, to go into the same reaction. It could be, so we're not, it's not that, I don't think we get to um, what kind of reaction is happening, um, but because we, we then are making ratios, um, of compounds measured on the same metabolomics platform using the same technology, um, statistically, we get some benefit in that we perhaps are then canceling out variability that was shared between them, uh, between so measurement, systematic kind of measurement variability that would be the same in the two um, because we're dividing that out when we create a ratio of one to the other, um, which potentially gives us stronger p-values and ultimately is more interpretable. Um, because it kind of connects to, ooh, this is happening molecularly. Why is that process occurring in some people that go on to disease and not in others? Like, you know, and let's look more into that. Um, so I thought, hey, is there an application to this to extend some of the work that I've been doing um, before? So um, we wrote a grant, as you do, um, and said, I've got an idea. Let's see if anybody also thinks it's a good one and you know wants to give me money to do this. Um, so we took our DAISY data that I had used in my dissertation and I kind of reanalyzed it in this framework. And so I took all the lipids. Um, so on the lipidomics platform, um, we had roughly 1200 lipids. Um, and you can see when we plot the p-values of those in a histogram that, you know, Here's your really small p-values, and you would love to see something like this, right, where you've got some a, a large number of compounds that seem to have small p-values, so as their signal in all these tests that we're doing. Um, and so we don't really see much signal at all, which is what we've seen before, right? Those volcano plots are not impressive, and neither is the histogram. But if we took, um, I said, hey, what happens if we take the most significant metabolite and uh, create ratios of all the other lipids on this platform, and then test those for progression from IA to type 1 diabetes. What does that look like? And we get this plot over here. So it's roughly the same number of compounds. There's one that's minus one, because we didn't make a, you can't make a ratio of one lipid with itself. Um, and, and so we're looking at the same number of compounds being tested, um, but we can see that the ratios actually may have a lot stronger relationship with diabetes than the individual compounds themselves. Um, so this was sort of the basis for this, um, the new work that I'm working on, um, where we are gonna look at ratios and, and essentially look at this idea in type one diabetes. Um, and so this is a RO3 that we got that was um, specifically for people wanting to work in type one new investigators and type one diabetes research. And so we're in the second year of this grant um, and we're gonna look at metabolite ratios and, and see like are there genetic influences on, on these. And, and you know, we're, the first aim is we're testing um, rather than individual compounds, metabolite ratios themselves with progression to diabetes to see um, what the signal looks like compared to what we have seen before and whether we find something new. Um, so I might share a little of what we found. Do you, did you say you were going to stop it, Daniel, or do you want to? No, I can, just... I can just uh, pause the, pause the recording. And, okay. And yeah.